has China's debt bubble begun to pop? We're going to take a look at that today. Uh, and we're going to take a look at it next week as well. But we are going to look at what the insiders are doing at Netflix as Netflix is near its all time high. And we have an update on what's happening over at the insider trading issue at Equifax. Remember a few months ago where they, there were a huge breach of data. China's government takes over and bang. Why do we care? Why does it matter to us? Hi everyone. I'm Lynette Zhang, chief market analyst here at ITM trading, a full service physical precious metals brokerage house, specializing in gold and silver and establishing strategies to help the individual through the upcoming reset and to thrive on the other side. Well, today in insider trading, of course, first we're going to look at what the sectors are doing. Overall, uh, for every $1 worth of buying, and remember the insiders are those that are running the corporations. So for every $1 worth of buying, we have $42.27 worth of selling. And you can see that the move continues choppy. But the ones that are really up at the top of this is technology, which have been taking advantage of these huge market moves that we've, and the volatility that we've been experiencing this year, particularly since February. And of course, the volatility continues into March. You can see that we do have one sector, media, that did selling, but did absolutely zero buying. So overall, we can see that certainly the insiders, the guys that are running in the co corporations, are absolutely taking advantage of the market and what's going on there. Especially at Netflix, Netflix would be in the technology camp. Now, an interesting thing I want to point out to you is this gap in January of this year, there was a huge spike in buying. You can see that there, and it created that gap. That gap has not been filled. So at some point, technically speaking, the expectation would be for, for uh, the Netflix stop to drop down and fill that gap. But in the meantime, Let's take a look at what the insiders, the guys running the corporation have been doing. The rust is the selling, the green is the buying. So it should be very obvious that they are taking advantage over this last year of this huge run up in the stock and they're taking their money out. Again, I always say that you should look at what the smartest guys on any given topic are doing for themselves. The insiders, we can see it in both of these. The insiders are selling. What are you doing? Sitting in there because they keep pushing the market higher? A little update on Equifax. Remember a few months ago, actually last September, because you can see it in this graph here, it was revealed that they had one of the largest data breaches in history of very sensitive information on pretty much every American, many Europeans, Canadians as well. We could certainly see what happened to the stock, but gosh, interestingly enough, he was the chief information officer. You think he might've known something at Equifax? And he decided to sell prior to that being leaked to the public. Equifax would have never let us know, but that information was leaked. So this is the very first uh, criminal charges that have been levied in that whole insider trading mess. And you right, might recall that there was some suspicious trading that we looked at around that. So we'll keep our eye on that. That's just the first criminal charges in the Equifax mess. Now, I came across an article on uh, the Chinese government taking over Anbang. And when I started to look into it, I saw a much bigger story there. So I'm just going to glaze over some stuff today on insider trading. And uh, next week, peak beneath the market is going to be much more in depth. 
But overall, why does that even matter to us? Well, since the crisis in 2008, uh, China has been tasked with or has been the global growth engine. And so there's been a lot of leverage, a lot of cheap money, a lot of a lot of debt with interest rates low and a lot of funny ways that some non-financial corporations in China have funded that debt. And with that debt, they went on a global shopping spree. The people that are up at the top understood that the Chinese economy was growing on huge debt and also trying to shift from a manufacturing economy to a consumer driven economy. And they didn't really have a lot of confidence with what was happening in the currency. So they went on a global buying spree. There are particularly four firms, I'm gonna mention them to you in a second, that went globally and just bought properties on this flood of very, very cheap money and funny financing. But that Ambang was key in there. That's an insurance company. The Chinese government was very nervous about the level of debt that was being accumulated. And from what they could see, because that's called a shadow bank, uh, the way that they funded it. So to try and head off the next financial crisis, they went in and they took over Ambang. Now, Ambang had bought about, in, in the U.S., about 12 very high level luxury complexes, for example, the Waldorf Astoria. And they bought them at market highs. I'm gonna go into this more next week. But the government went in and took them over, the Chinese government, and now they're looking to liquidate those properties to try and shore up the financing of Angbang, Anbang. However, this could very well be the tip of the iceberg. And let me show you why I said that. On this graph, you're looking at both outbound mergers and acquisitions, and mostly acquisitions, and inbound, right? So leaving the, fl the uh, funds flowing out of China, which are the darker red in here, and those that are putting investment in China. So you remember we've talked in the past about the flood of wealth leaving China. Well, it was going uh, to buy a lot of properties around the globe. Now, they're buying them somewhere near a high, which means that now China's got to liquidate those properties, but the real estate market, particularly in Manhattan, is soft. So they have all of that debt that they accumulated that is starting to come due in a softening market with rising interest rates. So the growth engine to the world, China, is vulnerable. Not only could that push real estate prices down more, which remember, real estate was one of the areas, it was stocks, bonds, and real estate that the central bankers had determined should be reflated. That's part of the reflation trade. It's gonna be hard to keep them floating if they have to liquidate a lot of newly accumulated assets into that market. I'm gonna talk a lot more about that next week and the debt, but can you see the problem? So that's the tip of the iceberg, particularly in what's happening with Washington and China. And again, I'm gonna get into that more next week as well. But you have the new treasury, uh, not treasury secretary, I'm sorry. The new secretary, I'm sorry. How <laughs> little brain, State Department, okay. So Mike Pompeo is going to be the secretary of state and he's gonna be shaking that up. Interestingly enough, he views China as one of the biggest threats to our position in the global system. He's not wrong. We're going to talk more about that, but he has a high level of influence in shaking up the whole State Department. And Larry Kudlow, who's definitely the stock market's friend, 
even though he is for free trade, not necessarily fair trade, he now has the uh, closer ear with the president and he can see that some of these regulations should be quite tough on China. So it could be kind of like poking a, a hornet's nest. We really don't know what any of those repercussions are going to be and what all of this tough talk is about, but it's definitely a changing wind in Washington between the U.S. and China. And that means, you know, with anybody sneezes, if it's China, if it's the U.S., the whole world catches a cold and it looks like we're about to be in some kind of battle with China. Really interesting. So next week, we're going to take a look at how vulnerable the whole world is to this upcoming battle. They better do it perfectly. They better do it in an orchestrated way or this could certainly topple the house of cards that we're living under globally. And, you know, China is not without weapons because they have certainly been tasked. Remember, it was in, uh, in um, October of 2016 when the Chinese Yuan became part of that SDR basket. The SDR, Special Drawing Rights, is the internal currency of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And China has been tasked with transitioning us from the current monetary system into the new monetary system. So I could certainly see how friction between the U.S., even if it's staged friction or if it's real friction, it doesn't matter. But you could certainly see how that level of friction could generate the crash that they need to generate enough fear to us accept the transition into the new system. So we have to be very conscious. Plus, on March 26th, guess what? You now have the oil futures trading in terms of yuan. Does that threaten the petrodollar, which is the reason why we've retained, the U.S. has retained the world reserve currency status? Because up until this moment, this is not so true. There have been bilateral trade agreements. But overall, governments have had to hold U.S. dollars in reserve to settle trades for oil. So on March 26th, you'll be able to buy oil with yuan. There'll be seven contracts that are traded. We'll have to keep our eye on that. I don't think it'll happen overnight as far as us losing that status. But this is huge. This is so huge. And where we don't seem to be accumulating gold... Well, look what the Chinese have been doing. And we really don't know because there is not one ounce of gold. If they mine it in China, it's not leaving China. If you're buying gold manufactured in China, like jewelry or something like that, you better declare it. You better bring it back. If you're visiting China, you better declare any gold jewelry you're bringing in or you're not leaving the country with it. So this is what they report. We don't really know how much they're hoarding, but China is very, very strategic. So I think it's interesting and worth noting that the contracts will deal with the underlying oil. Energy is extremely important in this new um, cryptocurrency universe that they want to move us into, energy. So what, what is China making sure that they're in position for? Oil and gold. Hold your wealth here because they know that in a reset, they know what happens. There's lots of data on it. All fiat money inflation in relation to gold gets burned off. Now, they've got a lot of debt that they're going to have to deal with on the government side. We're going to look at that next week as well as... Uh, as many other things that are really, I mean, what an interesting period of time. And there's so much that's going on. But airing in a few days is that interview that I did with Portfolio Wealth Global and Michelle Holiday. 
So stay tuned with Megan on all our social media. She'll let you know exactly when it's airing, but I'm, I'm thinking she told me Saturday. I could be wrong. Check with Megan. She'll know that for sure. Uh, next week, I have the X-22 report, which is always a fun interview. Dave is a very bright guy, and we'll let you know when that one airs. I have no idea what he wants to talk to me about, but there's so many wonderful things and interesting, maybe not so wonderful, but super interesting things going on that we could really talk about anything. Keep in mind, we by, uh, you think, the end of the day tomorrow, Carl, will have the... Uh, the uh, link set up. Okay. So anybody in the Northeast or anybody that wants to on May 19th, I'm going to be doing an in-person live event in Poughkeepsie, New York. So tickets should be ready to be on sale by the end of uh, the day on Friday. It'll be on our website. And I'm really excited about that. We only have 80 seats available, so it's first come, first serve. But uh, yeah, definitely sign up for that for On the Road with Lynette. And while I'm there, I'm also going to be doing a coffee with Lynette in, live in person with Gerald Salente. So I'm really looking forward to this period of time. And I'll probably take some pictures since that's my hometown. And I'll let you see the houses that I grew up in and the road that's named after me and all that fun stuff fun stuff, which I haven't been back there since my girls were, I think, nine months old and they're 36. So it'll be interesting to see how much that has changed. But, you know, make sure if you like this to give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe so that you'll be notified whenever we post new um, information on there or we do these live events. And of course, you can visit all of our other YouTube videos for lots of a variety of information. Um, and as always, we love those questions. So make sure they keep coming either via, you know, in comments below here or in Twitter or Facebook. You can email them to us. We're very, very accessible and we really want to create a site that is of value to you. That's really what we're all about. So that's it for today. I will see you tomorrow. And please, tomorrow I'm going to be talking about the impact of what's happening in the markets and, and where we are with the retirement systems and the level of funding, et cetera. So I think you're going to like that one a lot. It's a very important webinar or a YouTube video. And between now and then, please be safe out there. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.